Esoteric Discussions, a show that gives a voice to the hidden and unspoken aspects of our world, tackling topics in the realms of the metaphysical, the esoteric, the political, and social. So now, join me, your host, Valentine St. Aubin, as I take you on a journey of exploration. Welcome to Esoteric Discussions with me, your host. I am Valentine St. Aubin, and it's uh, another Wednesday, and it's time for Esoteric Discussions, a show that uh, explores the deeper issues and questions of life. So, I'm here every other Wednesday, um, but uh, during the RSL, I'm going to be here every Wednesday evening, um, giving you a variety of different shows so look out for me at 9 o'clock p.m. And um, I think if you like the strange and bizarre and if you like um, the hidden side of life, the hidden information that's around us, then um, you might be interested in tuning into the show. So it's the 19th of June, 2013, and the summer solstice is upon us. It will be arriving on the 21st of June. And, well, it will be officially the beginning of summer. Uh, Well, obviously, we haven't had much of a spring. It's been um, officially the the, the coldest spring on record for 50 years, since the last 50 years. Um, And, I mean, the wind has been cold. We've hardly had any sun. It's been raining. I think today was a summer day, I think. (laughs) But it was a bit humid and and overcast. But it was slightly warm, I think. Um, but uh, uh, the summer solstice is um, the turning point for summer so hopefully hopefully it will warm up just slightly for a few months but um, uh, well I'm not alone in the studio so we'll use the time anyway to um, to carry on the conversation and we can talk briefly about ancient Egypt and we can also talk about some other topics as well I have in the studio with me Pedro who's been a guest on my show previously a couple of times and um, and also someone from the flip side. Want to say hello? Hello, everybody. You want to introduce yourself? I'm Colin, and uh, I'm interested in everything. So, <laughs> but I don't know a lot about everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you were in the studio to to have a listen to to Dr. Valentine because he is such a phenomenal uh, speaker. But unfortunately, we can't touch base with him tonight. So, we'll have to. Have a conversation without him, I guess. Indeed. <laughs> I mean, we were going to talk about um, ancient Egypt, and you know, it's uh, it's one of those topics that you know we talk about things like the Illuminati, and um, there's all this iconography going on with um, the all-seeing eye um, uh, images of. Uh, Egyptian pyramids. We have that in hip hop. A lot of the the stars, like Jay Z, flashing the pyramid sign yeah. um, and things like that. Um, and so we seem we we have a a lack of understanding about Egypt. We really only know it through those eyes these days. But of course, Egypt has a long, long history. And I'm going to just off the top of my head. I mean, this is something that stuck with me for a long time. Um, and this was coming from one of the Greek um, historians of the time, uh, Diodorus Seculus, he said that, um, because he was a historian, and he asked a question to some of the ancient uh, academics and teachers of the time, how long has Egypt, how long has Kemet been around? And just so that people know, Kemet is the term that's used for Egypt, and when the Greeks went into Egypt, they pronounced Egypt as uh, sounding like Egypt, but that area of Egypt is known as Kemet, so that's that's why we have different names. But Egypt comes from the Greeks. But uh, So basically he proposed this question to some of the um, academics of the temples uh, in Egypt, and they said, well, what we are aware of is that uh, our history goes far back um, spanning over a cycle of about four different suns. 
Now that doesn't make very much sense to us. Mm. But what they were trying to say was that um, uh, because, of course, the Egyptians were great astronomers and stargazers, as many African societies were. And um, so they have a whole system of astronomy, and we it's been handed down to us um, as the Dendera uh, system, Dendera astrology, Dendera astronomy. So the ancient Egyptians were aware of the what we call um, the movement, the precession of the equinoxes. And basically what that means is that in the sky, there's a, a slow shift of um, the stars and, and uh, the, the objects that are in the sky moving very slowly. And this is where we get ages from. So we'll have, we've been in the age of Pisces for 2,000 years. Now we're moving into the age of Aquarius. That's another 2,000 years. So you add that up and you get um, 12 different ages. And you add 2,000 times 12, you get 24,000 years. So when they say four different suns, they mean a good, let's say, we'll, we round it up, 25,000 times four. So that's about 100,000 years. That's how far back they go. Wow. Um, and this is what people don't know. And, um, and this is where the confusion about Egypt uh, comes in because... The historians, the Egyptologists, there's a lot of confusion within um, <laughs> within those circles of, of those who study the history of Egypt because there has been a deliberate um, distraction being put into place to hide information. And, you know, we, we talk a lot on this show about... Um, uh, information being hidden, you know, and, and uh, uh, factual information that we should have at our fingertips, things that we should know. The average person doesn't know because it's not all their fault. It's because there are lies in the textbooks, um, there are lies all around us, the media is constantly misrepresenting information. So we're never clear as to what to believe um, when we start to question things. We believe it's all true until we start to question it and then we realize oh well there's some gaps here you know, this doesn't make sense well that doesn't make sense <coughs> so this is the same with, with, with um, Egyptian history and if you go to the universities they, they teach um, Egyptian history in a certain way uh, and but it's incorrect and one of the things that they taught about Egyptian history and this goes back to the 19th century and they still do it in the 20th century is that Egypt, um, they were never great seafarers. So that means they would have never left their shores. And that's a lie. No, that is, that is a lie. There's proof that they have, they were great seafarers and they did leave their shores. Um, so that's just one of the, the, the myths that are out there. But, you know, and, and these details are very important because this is what is being taught in our schools and in, in, in the higher education and the whole idea of, of saying that a culture such as Egypt, for example, had the technology to build ships because the great in the Great Pyramid we have Khufu's great long ship. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we have right. Khufu's great long ship. But what the historians always say is, Yeah, but they never they they would have never travelled because they wouldn't know how to circumvent the seas. <laughs> well, who, who would do that? Who would make a great ship and never have any intention well, of putting the, it on water? Well, that's the common sense. Uh, yeah, that's the common yeah. sense question, isn't it? Mm. Um, and that's you know that's the bottom line of this type of information is when you start to ask the common sense questions, you get common sense answers. Mm. Well, who would? And people would. Okay, so this is this is. Um, no, th these are the problems that we're faced with. But the experts will tell you, and it's a whole theory. They have, they call it the isol the isolationist theory, that uh, ancient civilizations didn't have the interest or capability to travel far and wide. It's very interesting. They have um, shown, uh, for instance, in uh, portrayed in movies, you know, uh, like the movie Cleopatra. We have Marc Antonio and all those uh, uh, war uh, generals mm. uh, that go back and forth to uh, uh, Alexandria, mm. and they do show 
big um, Egyptian boats. Uh, but I think the point here is that although they do show that in terms of uh, to show the how exotic and how great the Egyptian Empire was, but I think they tend to limit their uh, seafaring capabilities just to the Mediterranean, just to that little area there, uh, and uh, exclude any possibility of, for instance, um, of further afield trips, you know. And for such a great empire, which the, the Egyptians uh, had, uh, it would have been a natural thing to want to see the rest of the world. Uh, and as an, an analogy, uh, there's a, uh, a documentary, I think it's called uh, 1420... 1426 or 1428, yeah, I think. When the Chinese ruled the seas. Yeah, yes. The Chinese ruled the seas. Yeah. It's a similar thing where it does explore some hidden history that um, uh, the Chinese actually mm. went and uh, ventured out into the world, mapping all the, you know, by, by using a certain systems, surveying all the world. And uh, for this, they built several gigantic. Uh, junks, I think that's what they used to call them. This is big, uh, but because the, that endeavor was such a, a strain on resources and uh, a strain on uh, wood uh, materials and peoples and uh, monies, when they finished it, they said, "Look, we know that uh, how much this costs. We can never do this again." A little bit like some of of the enterprises of today. Yes, uh, when yes. they get too big. They don't do something like that again, or they um, they just never really begin doing it because they have similar um, experiences with economic disasters. And uh, so I think you know it's perfectly feasible that they did venture and go to other shores. It's just that we really don't know, mm. you well, know. That is, and mm. you have hit the the nail, you know, and and that is. Um, such a, a a good point to help elaborate what's going on here because China is another one because when they when they say the Egyptians didn't do this or didn't do that they don't just say the Egyptians they're saying ancient people the the Egyptians the the Chinese those from um, the Indian subcontinent all of the ancient people until the Europeans didn't have uh, as they like to say the faculty or the ingenuity to travel far and wide and it's completely false and there has been enough evidence now to completely refute those arguments um, and I'm glad to see that those ways of teaching and thinking are really starting to break down it's good to see that because there's people from different backgrounds different colors all trying to put their own research out and and you know come, come up against these small-minded opinions and we mm -hmm. have to keep in mind those opinions came from the 19th century and earlier you know I, I've been doing a little bit of research myself in the last mm, three months or so and uh, one of the things linked to what you're saying there that I came across was that when uh, Christopher Columbus got to um, on the, uh, I think it was Haiti on his first journey when he got there they, those people there told him that some blacks had, had already been there um, and uh, I mean I haven't gone into detail but it seems to me that pro the most likely place that these blacks came from was Africa, Africa yeah. <laughs> that's actually um, quite becoming a quite um, popular story yeah, that, yeah that's, it's becoming it's, it's now getting out into the open a lot more people are starting to, to hear that mm -hmm. um, and yeah it, it's something that uh, is moving and bubbling um, up because Christopher Columbus was not the first person to go and find them Indeed. I've been, I came across some very interesting research which I think you two might might find of interest I was um, doing some research on on just that, you know, uh, visit visitations of maybe Africans um, into North America. And I came up with a story that came out in 1909. Um, it, was, uh, it was an article written in the um, Phoenix Gazette in 1909. And it was reporting that um, uh, in the Grand Canyon, <laughs> in the Grand Canyon, there are some caves hidden away and inside they were excavated 
and what they found inside were um, Egyptian. Well, they they called them they called them Egyptian mummies at the time, um, and well, I'll tell you. Uh, why they do think still that they are Egyptian mummies, but they found mummies. They found um, like Tibetan and Hindu type idols. Mm. They found hieroglyphs on the walls, um, and of course, the only uh, culture that really uses hieroglyphs are the Egyptians. Um, we have other types of writing, like cuneiform and things like that, but hieroglyphs are pretty much particular to Egypt um, they found all sorts of things swords, jewels all sorts of things so they excav- excavated this, this site it was a, a professor of anth- anthropology um, uh, some other academic type person and they had the Smithsonian Institute on board now this, the Smithsonian Institute had been around since like the 1860s They've been around for quite some time. So they were brought in to help uh, excavate this site. Now, no one has actually ever heard of anything about this no, in the Grand I, Canyon. I, no, I haven't heard about no, it either. I haven't heard no. anything of it. Mm-hmm. Would you like to know maybe why you haven't ever heard about it? <laughs> um, <laughs> tell us, please. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you know I'm going to tell you, right? Yeah. <laughs> well... Mm. The, the interesting story is, now, this story, um, I found out this story through um, a researcher by the name of um, uh, David Hatcher Childress, and he's like an Indiana Jones type personality, and he's he's done a lot of research into ancient cultures and um, things of that nature around the globe, and this is a particular story he's, he's had interest in um, for years, uh, since the early 90s. He's been chasing this story for a long time. So he, from his point of view, because a lot of people will have questioned, well, was that article that appeared in the newspaper, was it... Genuine. Was mm-hmm. it genuine? Was mm-hmm. it fake? Mm-hmm. Was it a hoax? Because they did do a lot of hoaxing back then, just like they do today. Yes. <laughs> they do a lot of hoaxing today, guys, as well, mm-hmm. with fines and things like that. Mm-hmm. So we always have to be careful. And weapons of mass destruction. We- yeah, weapons yes. of mass For destruction. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean just back then they hoax they can hoax mm. today so he went to see if you could find the validity of this story um, and through research and when you start researching things it's funny the people that come out of the woodworks of who might may be holding missing pieces of information and what he found was um, because the, the strange and bizarre uh, situation with this story is these two these two academic people that were part of the excavation uh, with the Smithsonian Institute, they had pretty much disappeared. There was no trace of their existence. They just disappeared. So that's why people were asking if Mm. it was a hoax. So he was trying to find out if he could find these two people. And he managed to find one of them. He managed to find one of them. So he can prove that one of them did exist. And he could prove that that person was into researching and, and doing... Archaeological... Uh, yeah, type... Uh, digging. Uh, diggings and things. Now, the other interesting um, connection with this story is that um, uh, the story was reported again about a year later. And again, in the story, they, they said the same thing and they sort of gave an update to say, well, what we found in the caves were seems to be mummies, but Egyptian mummies... Because in that area um, of the, around the Grand Canyon, the Native American Indians there, they don't have a tradition of mummifying their dead. So that's got nothing to do with them. The only people that we know of that mummify their dead are Egyptians. So it was things like that that were in the, the story that, that sort of made it very interesting. Mm. Um, so as I said, this uh, this current researcher, David Hatcher Childress, he, he concluded that he thinks it's very real. And I will say to, I will say this because people don't realise this. There is a program called Warehouse Thirteen, which is out. It's a spoof thingy, you know, it's on the sci fi channel. But the the concept of Warehouse Thirteen is that there are artifacts and pieces of history and information that don't fit into our timeline or don't fit into the story they're trying to tell us so they have to hide them away that's the story of warehouse 13 if any of you guys ever watched that that show 
And I mean, how yeah. they how they managed to do that, and at the same time, um, talk about uh, being critical and being not you know not believing everything you're told how they manage to do both those things at the same time is incredible it's it's an illusion they've created a world of illusions but basically this is something i've come across time and time again the smithsonian institute is what we know it's the name that we know but they are known to lock things away if they do not fit into the timeline um and I'll give some more examples mm. of that. But I'll give a really good example right now. Have you heard of the nurse Mary Seacole? Yes, I have. Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, me too. Jamaican, born in Jamaica. Yeah, she was a Jamaican-born mm. nurse. Mm. She did a fantastic amount of work to help heal soldiers and things of that nature. She, she was a contemporary of uh, Florence Nightingale. Nightingale, yeah. yeah. Mm. She went to the front lines in Russia when the English were there fighting. And um, she sold everything to be part of that war effort Mm. and she helped to heal so many soldiers thousands and thousands well back in the day Mary Seacol became a big star she was well known for her work and she was given a a star of uh, some kind of honorary um, uh, yeah honorary mm, medal medal she was by the queen Mm. she moved um, you know after the years of war and what have you as an older woman she moved around in the, in the circles of the aristocracy she went to the fancy parties there's photos of her you know back in the day when they first started making photos and you see her and stuff and there was a portrait commissioned of her now in modern times this may be about 20 years ago now guess where that portrait ended up don't tell me in the Smithsonian <laughs> Warehouse 13 <laughs> Warehouse 13 yeah also known as <laughs> well kind of <laughs> it, end, it ended up in the basement of the National Archives Gallery with dust all over it uh, forgotten in uh... forgotten <sighs> she was she was written out of our history mm. now she was a contemporary mm. of Florence Nightingale mm-hmm. now Florence Nightingale did not like Mary Seacole yes I'm and she was also a very yeah. racist woman yes so yes. was it Mary Nightingale that we needed to honour? That, that was the debate, I suppose. Who should we honour? I guess, yeah. Because the story is, Mary Seacole went to the front line and she Crimean went... Crimean War. Yeah, yeah. The, the Crimean War, and she went to Florence Nightingale and she offered herself, and Florence Nightingale told her, no, we don't accept your kind. Mm-hmm. She told her that. So anyway, the, the, her, her portrait after she died ended up in the basement of the National Portrait Archives with dust all over it. It's a beautiful portrait. Well, it was rediscovered because people began, you know, there's been a lot of research done over the years now. A lot of people, as I say, there's lots of people trying to put pieces of things together. People are opening their minds. They're looking at things in a different way. Mm. And also as as university programs start diversifying their education uh, degrees and things like that, you know, people start becoming specialized in other fields of conservation and preservation and research and obviously those are good things to uh, uncovered yeah, um, absolutely uh, undiscovered history yeah so you know she's a very good example of how you can hide mm. things mm. very good example and um, what's happened today is Mary Seacole is now she's on the curriculum I know she's on the curriculum of a lot of schools in the London area. They teach about her. And I believe across the country they're starting to, to teach about her. At least she's an example of, of, of someone from black history that they like to use. So, you know, what I'm saying, I've, I've gone through that long winter story and I've gone off topic slightly um, against uh, Egypt. But the, the point, what I'm trying to say is, because you asked me, Colin, why and how would they do it? Mm-hmm. Well, they do these things when they do these things because they want to create um, an idea of a history line or present information in a certain way. So if something doesn't fit in, they just leave it out. This is most non-scientific, right? Wow. <laughs> this is but this is the totally, world that we have. Yeah. But there are obviously agendas that yeah. uh, superpose themselves over yes. uh, what's right. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Agendas, and this is what it comes down to. So with that story I was just saying also about the Grand Canyon, now you start to understand well how how that can happen. If it's not fitting into what they want us to know, then it has to be hidden and removed. Um, 
and that's just one example. There's so many of them. Mm. People from the Commonwealth would support, you know, when it's time for uh, time for war in this case to defend the 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 land, you know, that they, these people they have no no problems in giving up what they in leaving their families behind and even selling their possessions to go and fight for for well. For the yes, queen, indeed, or yeah. for the, yeah. for for those that yeah. perhaps they feel have uh, have given them perhaps uh, certain opportunities, or you know, there's a certain some, uh, certain loyalty there of sorts, and they they go and leave everything behind and mm. they do it, and we see that, for instance, with uh, uh, actually by the uh, if I recollect correctly uh, during the Iraq War, uh, there was some footage, you know, sometimes once in a while on TV, and there was this situ this time I saw, uh, as just about as a, a journalist was commenting on the soldiers walking in this desert, and um, uh, I saw that the soldiers, although the journalist was English, you know, British, uh, the soldiers actually they were from Nepal, so they they are still during the Iraq war there were a lot of uh, uh, soldiers from other parts of the world right. that have a certain allegiance uh, to the, uh, the well the, the the British army and uh, and some of them even today are seeking for pensions uh, so that's the other part of the spectrum I know who you're talking about and I can't remember what they're called but they have a particular name yes and it slips it, my mind at the moment mm -hmm. but um, yes and that's again another illusion that's been created because you know, obviously, when we think of um, war veterans of World War One, World War Two, people of the Panama and Commonwealth joining all aren't the, the really thought of as being part of that. No, yeah. but sure. they were definitely. Yeah. And they uh, died the same as anybody they else. They died the same just as anybody <laughs> else. But, but it's true because when then you open yeah. the, the history uh, books, even yes. about the Second World War, you're just talking about now, uh, these uh, well. Um, uh, black people, basically, people of different ethnic backgrounds, are normally don't have a presence, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and and so many of them, you know, from uh, the West Indies, from Panama, uh, and other places, have really fought fought in the Second World War. Yes, so it is indeed. a it, so, basically, the reason now the question is why, and and it is unfortunate, but it is that political agenda that uh, the, the societal uh, construct uh, that prevails within uh, well sometimes they could call it uh, real politics it's what you do at a certain time and a certain ideology of the time the certain ideas that people hold um, and then of course uh, th those things do change and uh, I'm glad that they that has changed but they are particular to a certain period yes uh, I do also recall Briefly, uh, that uh, also saw a program not that long ago that actually was talking about uh, a huge library, I think in this area actually, maybe Cambridge or some other area like that, where they kept all the uh, books, magazines and bulletins of the Victorian age that didn't make it uh, big. So for sort of small publishing uh, houses, uh, self-publishing authors, you know, to, titles, for instance, to do with risque uh, mm -hmm. type of literature, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and uh, uh, and maybe other topics, maybe p perhaps to do with sort of, uh, you know, uh, maybe monsters and vampires and things like that, sure. you know, sort of be right. more off, right. the, off the beaten track type of uh, literature. And they just kept and catalogued and just sitting there because obviously they, they don't know what to do with it. And, that, right, right. and that's, that's a, that's example, a good point. And, yeah. you know, and so we're asking common sense questions like, but why would they do that? Well, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a layer, it's layers of protocol. Um, and then, of course, you have those that work within these institutions. Their hands are tied because, you know, they, they're, they're indoctrinated in a certain way to understand things in, a, in their own way as well, in, in the the approved and academic way so they have a hard time facing new information themselves so mm. it becomes a perpetual mm. cycle Indeed. You know? guys we're going to just take a quick break and um, play a couple of uh, jingles and station identification and uh, we'll come back to this chat okay okay you don't need your radio or PC to listen to Peter FM. Use your smartphone instead. Just use your browser, connect to www.peterborough.fm and you're in. Simple. Welcome back to Esoteric Discussions with me, your host, Valentine St. Auburn. And um, this is a show where 
we like to go down deep into the rabbit hole and talk about um, all the strange and bizarre and hidden aspects of our world. And, well, my guest that I had booked, we had um, a strange, uh, well, mishap, I guess you could say. So it all worked its way out, as everything always does anyway, um, because I was having a bit of an audience with, with for my guest, and it's it's happened that we're all, we are our own audience so (laughs) so it's worked out anyway and I think it's nice to also just be able to talk amongst ourselves about these types of topics because to be honest people don't get to talk we don't no 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 and and this is what I find interesting is that when you start to talk to people one-on-one like when you get them alone and it's quiet and you ask them questions about how they might see the world it's surprising what comes out of their mouth But I think because we have been so conditioned with the television and all of the movies coming at us, people get become afraid Mm. to say, Mm. well, I kind of believe that this kind of exists, you know. Um, And of course, we're also busy. So unless you take the effort and make the effort to do the research yourself, it can be intimidating trying to relearn everything that you think you know. (laughs) Now, I was sorry. Did you want to say something, Petra? I mean, we look back, for instance, at the TV series in the old days, you know, well, not that long ago, the, uh, Jason and the Argonauts, and uh, those series used to be based on some sort of uh, real uh, writings, you know, philosophers and myths and mythology and uh, legends. And and now it gets a bit much when you have, uh, uh, for instance, films like uh, the ones with the, uh, where you have cowboys fighting aliens oh, yes you know things like that completely out of you know i know it's okay to dr- to have fantasy and but but when there's so much of that you know uh that sense of educating through film becomes replaced with just pure entertainment course, yes, yes. and because we are we have such a limited uh, time uh, or net time because either we're in school or we're working or taking care of this and that th- it leaves a limited amount uh, or short limited amount for, for real time to use mm-hmm. that in a sensible way to kind of you know educate ourselves so if it's taken up with uh, less sort of educational type of things you know it, it takes longer to get there eventually if you do wake up and, and feel a certain curiosity to learn other things or the, the real world you yeah know. Well, I mean, the the theme of the show tonight was supposed to be about ancient Kemet, which is um, another term that we use to describe Egypt. Um, and, well, what I wanted to, to add, because when I started doing some serious research, this is going back a few years, um, I was doing research on uh, black history in Scotland and Ireland, those areas. And I sort of came across what I'm going to tell you about in a long-winded way. Now, um, well, how should I start? Well, what, what I'll start with is I came across an amazing book by someone named Lorraine Evans, and it's called Kingdom of the Ark. And I, had, I, I, I mean, I love to read. I, I, I've got loads of books that I have, and I'm always reading something. I could not put that book down, and it's a real thick book. It's that kind of book that people go, oh, <laughs> I don't want to see that, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but I loved every word that was in that book. It was mind-blowing, the information that was in that book. And basically, Lorraine Evans is an Egyptologist. But she's an Egyptologist who, again, is one of these breaking away from the traditional way of how Egyptologists are being taught. And she she basically, she, she questions, she has questioned um, everything uh, that is accepted uh, by Egyptologists and has looked for new evidence. And what she found was startling. Now her book basically um, focuses on archeological uh, digs and finds and evidence of Egyptian um, boats and jewelry and things like that found here in the UK. Now your your eyebrows are going up, it Colin, did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't hear that we find anything like that in the UK. I mean, we've got what Time Team? Did they yes. ever find any Egyptian no, jewelry or no, boats no. or anything like that? Nope. I've never seen them find them. Maybe some toothbrush <laughs> from the Roman times. Yeah, know? it's always yeah, something from the Roman it. times or something like that. What was the name of that book? The name of the book is called Kingdom of the Ark and her name is Lorraine Evans and the the book came out around the year 2000 so it's been out for quite a few years now and um, I read it a few years ago 
and at the time I was trying to see if I could find any further information on her and things and for quite a few years she just sort of disappeared so I had assumed that something might have happened to her <laughs> because of what she wrote or but she has resurfaced and she does have a website so if anybody wants to have a look for themselves you can visit her website so it's just lorraineevans.com and um, you can find her book there and okay. some of the new things that she's researching but a very interesting woman, and I think I'm going to try to get her on this show as well Ooh, at some point. Be good. Yeah, because mm. I think she she certainly has a, a lot of interesting information to share as an archaeologist. But um, as time is escaping from us, I, I need to make this brief. But basically, some of the finds that she that she found that just blew my mind were these two. She talked about the legend of Scotter, and the legend of Scotter um, is a story that talks about an Egyptian princess who had to leave Egypt um, around 1350 BC and that was during the time of uh, the pharaoh Akhenaten's uh, reign. She had to leave, Akhenaten was her father, she had to leave because of what was going on within his reign. We don't have time to go too fully in depth with what he was up to but he basically usurped the high priest order and made them redundant because he said there are no other gods there's only one it's the sun mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. he he completely changed the the religious landscape of egypt and he is the father of tutankhamun who they also mm -hmm. killed so she had to run for her life right? from, from many deities he converted into monotheism mm -hmm. yes he did yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so that that's the story so there's the story of this egyptian princess who had to run away so she runs away with her husband and goes far away to a land known far away now she ends up well she goes through the Mediterranean and of course now the Mediterranean is a whole nother subject because there have been um, cultures and cult layers and layers of cultures in the Mediterranean from the Phoenicians to the Moors and Carthaginians. Carthaginians I mean there's just been every one of them that has ever existed ends up making <laughs> the whole of the Mediterranean, the Iberian Peninsula part of their landscape um, and uh, so it was just normal to end up there and touch base before going to this land far away mm -hmm. <laughs> well this land far away was the UK, was England mm -hmm. and she and her and there was a whole bunch of people that came with her from what the story says, it was her and quite, quite a few people running away with her and her husband and they ended up in Scotland and they stayed there for quite some time and then they travelled down and ended up in Ireland now, it's a very interesting story because when I was doing some research, uh, some postgraduate research in Scotland, and I had been reading that book, right? So I asked a few people. I asked some academics. I asked some local people. I, asked, I was asking people, have you ever heard of the legend of Scotter? Mm -hmm. And what did I have as a response? Warehouse 13. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was that look of, yeah. We were taught that as kids, but everyone said, yeah, I've heard of that. And there was that look like, oh, yes, I remember it. I remember that. I haven't heard it for a long time, but I remember it. I'm not saying that everybody in Scotland knows about the legend of Scotty, but it seemed like everybody I spoke to knew about it. Uh, but, but, as, but not as uh, factual history. Was as they knew it as a legend. As a, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. And was the legend not on the Irish Chronicles? Well, this is the thing. So I started researching what she was researching because she got the, this legend from the Chronicles. The Chronicles, the, the Scotty Chronicles, which, is, which are the Chronicles of Scotland. And then she traced these same, the same story to the Chronicles that are written for Wales and also the Chronicles written for Ireland. Now these are what we would call um, primary resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, primary mm -hmm. sources mm -hmm. um, you can't really do much better than that you know it's either that or oral history okay so that's as good as it gets with the proof so that's how she found the story so I, I took that and I asked people and they said yes they've heard it so that in itself is just mind blowing it because is, yeah. it brings a yeah. connection to mm -hmm. Egypt mm -hmm. now there's a second part that's mm -hmm. mind blowing there's many parts but we're going to run out of time the boats that were found in what we call Ferriby, North Yorkshire. Again, guys, do your research. Go have a look. 
were called the ferry bean boats. They were found um, around World War I period by a couple of brothers. And then for like the next 50 years, academics fought amongst themselves to figure out what the lineage of these boats were. There were three of them. And of course, back in those times, in the 1940s, 1950s, all the academics were saying, these are Viking long, was it longhorn ships? These are Viking ships. They have to be because they're the only one. They're the only ones that would travel because the Egyptians didn't travel, the ancients mm-hmm, didn't travel, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So it had to be the Vikings. Well, to cut a very long story short, um, more academics in the '60s and '70s, with new information coming forward, had a look at these boats, and they said, "No, those are not Viking boats. They're Egyptian. You can tell by the way that the ropes." wrap around the planks of wood, the type of wood that's being used, the style. The style of boats are a small replica of the boats found in Khufu's pyramid. And Khufu was a great pharaoh and he had he had this life size boat made and then all the parts so uh, uh, pulled well, apart uh, and mm. buried with him when he died. Now of course, what did the old academic say in the nineteenth century? The Egyptians didn't travel. So he had this life-size boat just for fun, okay? <laughs> but anyway, so these boats, these Ferebi boats, were a small representation of the boat that's found in the mm. Khufu pyramid. Mm. So what did they do with the Ferebi boats? They locked them away. They locked them in the basement of the whole museum because they could not fit them into the timeline. Now, this book that I was telling you about, Lorraine Evans, please do have a look at it mm, because well. those are just a, two, just a couple of examples of the information that she uncovered. And there's a whole story there as well with um, uh, the Hill of Tara, which is the place where the Irish kings were buried and Egyptian jewellery and beads are being found there as well. So that's a bit of a brief <laughs> introduction of, of an alter- alternative way of looking yeah, I at I think another, uh, another good uh, in- investigative journalist is Bethany I think it's Bethany Hughes Bethany Hughes, yeah, yeah she's, she's quite she's good as well she's done a lot of work on mainstream television I mm-hmm. mean, it, even as much as just showing the um, connection between the Mediterranean and the UK going back thousands of years because they won't even accept that the Mediterranean have come into the UK as well they don't want to connect the two so she's done a lot of uh, documentaries I believe on channel 4 showing pottery and all sorts of finds that are just there to show hey there were Mediterranean people coming to the UK Mm, well before mm -hmm. the Romans (laughs) indeed it's easy enough to get from the Mediterranean it's easy isn't it it's common sense again isn't it so Mm. Well, guys, I just want to thank you because we've run out of time and it's time for your show, Colin. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> okay, flip side. It's yeah. been brilliant. But, uh, right. yeah, that's, it's been really fun. I mean, I'm sad that my guest couldn't be here tonight, but... Um, Another time. I have a big mouth, so I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not what's the, it's not the mouth, it's what's behind the mouth. <laughs> Um, but no, it's, it's been great. And um, as I say to everyone, you know, always do, um, always do your own research. Never just listen to one person and uh, accept that as fact but I think if you if I know it sounds scary to say do your research but it's just small baby steps you know the first step go read that book by Lorraine Evans you although know? I guess what you're doing right now is also facilitating that, mm-hmm. that, that those first steps into mm-hmm. research well that's the purpose of this show so um, so hopefully you guys might have learned something new tonight I want to thank my guests Pedro and Colin from the flip side and, uh, and for you listening and I'll be back next week with another esoteric discussions show um, but until next time as I always say keep your eyes on the stars One station, many communities.